Welcome to our second official IPA 2.0 um, webinar. Before we begin, I just wanted to say a few things about how to interact with us. If you guys have a question, you can ask the question in the chat window or the Q&A window. The chat window is public, the Q&A is private, that's the only difference. If you want to come on and ask your question live, just raise your hand. There's a little hand at the bottom of your screen there, and uh, we'll bring you on live to ask that question. David's going to be fielding the questions today as I'm presenting. Feel free to interrupt us at any point and ask your question, especially if um, you don't understand something. Uh, that's the whole point of this, is to elaborate on, on those areas that you don't quite understand. With that, I want to introduce to you my partner, David Andrade. He has been instrumental in helping get us to this point with IPA 2.0. He's actually um, helping to market it as well. This webinar isn't about IPA 2.0. It's more about how to quickly analyze an, a, a note and to price it correctly. I, I do want to put out there that if there are questions related to the software itself, just let us know. But we're not going to focus on that today. We're just going to focus on the note stuff. David, did you want to say anything? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, again, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Hope everybody had a great holiday weekend. It's deserving. And I uh, hope you had a great time with your family, friends, or whatever you did. Uh, I will be here monitoring any questions you may have. And uh, you can ask questions at any time. I'll interrupt Joe and to answer your question. Joe, go ahead. And I also want to say, uh, for those of you who need help downloading IPA 2.0 or, or getting it set up, especially if you're already an existing user, please set up an appointment with us and uh, we can kind of go from there, especially with existing users, because the existing users have to be set up a little bit different because we're offering them a free upgrade to um, 2.0. So just let us know, either email myself or, or David and we'll get you set up. Now, what I've done is I've gone ahead and already input an asset in here because we're not focusing on IPA 2.0 um, application. We're looking at uh, how to use it as a tool to identify a good strike price and to analyze a note that has hair on it. So this particular note has some hair on it. And I'm gonna kind of walk you through what that is and um, how to properly set your strike price accordingly. So as you can see, this, this property is in Georgia. The, it, it's a non-performing note, it's first position. The unpaid principal balance is at, uh, th that the seller has provided us is at $205,726. The original loan balance was at 199, and the reason why it's flagged in red right now is because the unpaid principal balance is higher than the original loan balance. And what that means typically is that there's either a loan modification or some kind of fee tacked on to the original loan balance. And we don't know what that is because the seller hasn't provided us that information at this point. Um, in some cases, the sellers will provide collateral, but uh, I would say 90% of the time, 95% of the time, you're not gonna get that collateral until after the, your indicative bid goes in and you enter into that grace period for um, doing your due diligence on the note. So with that in mind, we're, we're gonna assume we don't have that information and we're moving forward just to identify whether or not this is a, a good note worth pursuing or not. Most people will just assume that that $205,000 for, uh, for the balance is the UPB, but I'm gonna show you that it's, it's actually not and, and that if you're, Placing your bid based on that number, you're leaving money on the table. And I'm gonna show you how. And so, so what I'm gonna show you right now is I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at uh, the AM schedule and we're gonna look at the, how it lays out. So there's quite a bit of hair on this one. And the first thing uh, right off the bat that we see is that there's uh, 14 years of delinquency. So number one, either it's just been sitting there and the lien holder has, hasn't done anything because they don't want to move forward with foreclosure or COVID or, or who knows what happened. But I can tell you this, that it went delinquent in 2008, which was right around the time where everything started collapsing. So maybe this was one of those 
deals that got shuffled in, in a big pile of, of deals that hasn't been touched for a while. And um, now they're just trying to unload. So with that in mind, if we take a look at the SAM schedule, we can see that the that the buyer paid for roughly, you know, a year, maybe a little over a year. They have 20 payments into it, and then the rest are delinquent today. So um, this basically shows us uh, when our when the current date is. This is the current pay period, and that they are roughly 168 payments delinquent. There are 14 years delinquent. The, the statute of limitations in Georgia is six years. So we would have to deal with that uh, moving into this and we would have to know that and account for it and put any expenditures associated with that into this, this analysis as well. That said, um, the other thing that I'm looking at is what is it gonna cost the buyer to reinstate this loan? At this point, the buyer has to basically pay the lien holder $294,894 to, to reinstate. Now, the likelihood of that happening is pretty low, but we'll get into that as well. Uh, this also includes the, the, um, the difference between what the seller is providing us and our reverse calculated unpaid principal balance. So the seller has provided us this 205 1,726. We reverse calculated the UPB based on the dates provided and the um, and the AM schedule information that the seller has provided us. So this is the true UPB based on the information the seller has provided us, 197,000. The difference between the two is $8,458. Now, that $8,000 is money that would be left on the table if you were to bid on this this note and and bid on that 205,000 the reason being is because at this point you don't know if if that $8,458 is fees you don't know if it's um um a loan modification you don't know if any of it's interest bearing or recoupable you have no clue at this point so you have to assume that none of it's recoupable and you have to place your bid based on on that notion and we're gonna we're gonna go through that and i'm going to show you how to do that um, when we get into the analysis are there any questions to this point with that i'm not going to change anything i'm going to leave the seller's unpaid principal balance in there and we're going to go right into the uh, analyzer. <clears throat> now I've already pre-run the analytics on it and brought in the information uh, from the internet. We're looking at a an ARV of 343,000 and um, based on that ARV we're assuming that the as is value is is going to be less and this is this is way overkill and it's significantly less uh given the fact that this this property was built in 2002 it's probably going to be more around that 300 320 thousand dollar mark uh, but we're going to for conservative purposes we're going to leave it at 280. now the seller has said you know, I'm looking for 75 to 80 percent of UPB on this non-performing note. Now, most people out there would say, you know, I'm, you know, that's just way too high. I'm not paying that kind of money on a non-performing note, especially one that has hair on it. Well, I'm here to say that if you do, if you look at the numbers and you understand them, paying a little bit higher uh, percentage on the the non-performing isn't necessarily a bad idea. I, we've actually purchased notes over that are non-performing um, at 110% before, and we've made money. So it really comes down to your, you know, what your return is against each exit strategy as you look at those. Now, <clears throat> when I was saying that um, if you if you base your 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 offer price off of the UPB that the seller has providing you. In this case, it's the 205727 here. Your offer price is gonna be that 75% of what that number is, and, and it comes out to 154,000. 
what you're doing is you're you're giving the seller money because that eight thousand dollars that's questionable right now you're bidding against so what we do is we say okay if that's the case i'm going to go back to my am schedule and i'm going to send the difference to ipa which is basically going to change the upb to this calculated upb and it's going to set the eight thousand four hundred fifty eight dollars into um a corporate advance category that's non-interest bearing so when i come back to analyze it you'll see that the upb has changed from that 205 down to 197 and that we've we've actually accounted for that 8400 in the lender advances so we're not actually bidding we're placing our bid only on the unpaid principal balance at this point so our offer price goes down and now you can see that we're, we're at 78 percent because our, our so there was a two percent difference so that two percent could mean a lot to a lot of people when they're when they're uh, looking at tight margins so if i wanted to recalculate my offer price at this 75 percent of upb I'll, all i really need to do is uh, recalculate my uh, my offer and now instead of the 154 I'm at 147 so so what I want to know from from this point is okay based on this offer price and the value of the property moving forward what does it look like if I were to reperform this I mean it, and the likelihood of that happening we already know is pretty low because to fully reinstate this this property was going to cost the borrower 294,000. Now, if the property is worth 343 and they have to fully reinstate it at 294 and there's only 145,000 in equity, the likelihood of them doing anything is is very low. They you know, most likely you're just going to walk away. So this would be a good candidate for maybe a cash for keys kind of deal. And if you can't do the cash for keys, we, we, we would want to look at the foreclosure and how that foreclosure unfolds. So we, we come down to our foreclosure exit strategy. And the question that we ask is, well, what's our maximum bid? And currently our maximum bid um, would be set to 453, which far exceeds the value of the property. Now, if we wanted to set our bid at a strike price or or, or I, I should say a return price like for instance in this case i've set it to 20 percent so i've basically said the minimum i'm willing to make is 20 percent on this deal if i'm if if i want to make 20 percent what's the minimum bid amount or where do i start my bid at auction and the answer is 194,000. So if I start my bid at 194,000 and the property is worth 343, what's the likelihood of me selling this at foreclosure to make that 20%? It's actually pretty high. In fact, you can probably um, start the, the bidding a lot higher, uh, maybe even 50%. So we can come down here and we can actually change that 20 to 50 and we can take a look at it. Now it's at 50% and our minimum bid set at 243 still that's a really good deal and, and, it, and it'll probably sell for that amount at foreclosure so we'll leave it there and we'll say okay we're going to start our bid at that you know 243 mark to make that 50 percent return now you can see right off the bat we're paying 75 percent of the upb okay our strike price is at 147 we we're fairly confident that the borrower is not going to reinstate and we're probably going to go through a foreclosure process. We, we already know that we also have to deal with um, statute of limitations and get that corrected. So that's going to cost us uh, a little bit of money as well. So we might want to um, boost up our, our legal fees accordingly. So what, what I'll do is um, instead of uh, $5,000 for attorney fees, I'll say 10,000 just to, you know, give me some cushion. And, um, and with that 10,000, I can re recalculate everything within the, the system. And, and what this will do is it'll change the 
returns and annual returns and so forth. Now so you're not we, saying, I'm, I'm sorry, Joe, he, he's not, I mean, we're, he, he adjusted the price to, to I mean, the, the, the amount to 10,000 as an example, it may not be, but typically we'll have a little bit more hair, it will cost a little bit more money. So some of these other costs may be adjusted as well. So well, we can yeah. put it at 20,000, we can put it whatever. What uh, 10, 10, I think 10 would be good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so right now we have that accounted in with the foreclosure um, legal fees. And with all of that in there, we're still looking at uh, 250 starting off uh, our minimum bid at foreclosure. The likelihood of it selling at foreclosure and us getting that 50% is pretty high. So we're trying to mitigate risk here and we're trying to figure out how to properly purchase this note and what our, our potential returns might be if we were to get to this point. Now, let's say for instance, nobody bids on this and it just sits there and you take the property back. Well, that in that case, um, I'm gonna look at um, wholesaling it. And now I have additional fees in there, like closing fees and agent fees that I have to, to deal with. So my capital, my overall capital invested goes up just like it did with the foreclosure and adding legal costs. And with, with my overall capital now at 179, you know, I started with 147, now it's at 179. And my as is value set at 214,000, which it's probably really low. I'm thinking this is gonna be more like 300. I'm gonna put it at the 300 mark because this is a fairly new property and there's probably not a ton to do on it. Uh, and I think that 43,000 is plenty of um, any kind of fixing that you have to do to the property. It's gonna be plenty. And if you wanted to sell it as is, I think that 300 is probably a fair price for that. Hey, hey Joe, real quick, I do have a question. A question came in from Cindy. Mm -hmm. uh, she had asked is, uh, can you please go over again why the max bid at foreclosure is $453,007? Yeah, it's, and, it's that much because there's so much in the reinstated amount. So um, they have to fully reinstate at 294. Plus there's um, gonna be rearages on it that uh, are unforeseen. Plus, you know, that, that uh, corporate advances are on top of that. So there's, there's a lot that goes into that number. And um, I could probably spend an hour talking about that. And Cindy, if you want me to go over that in detail with you off, off this, I'm happy to do that. Uh, one more question, Joe, uh, Linda asked, um, are you licensed in Georgia or how, or do you avoid that going through your servicer? Uh, typically you're going to go through a servicer that's licensed in whatever state that you're, you're, you're dealing in. So if you're, if you're going to purchase this note and you're going to um, purchase it in Georgia, that servicer better be licensed in, in Georgia. Otherwise, you know, you could get into trouble. So make sure that your servicer is licensed in the state that you're doing business in. Thanks for the questions. Okay. Now, going back to the wholesale aspect of it, we took the property back and, um, and in taking it back and, and our capital invested at this point being 179,000, which it, it could be more or less, you know, depending on the, what it took to get to this point legally. Um, we're looking at a roughly around a 52% overall return or a 33% annual return. And w the reason why we break it down like this is because everybody wants to understand what their annual return is on their money rather than the overall return. So we're, we're into this about 17.7 .7 months. And based on the time frame that we're into it, our overall return is 33.1%. And that's what we want to look at. So if, if we're doing the analysis and we're understanding that we're at this 33.1% on the wholesale, and up here, we're at that, um, at the, at the uh, 50% mark, and we started our bidding at 250, what we could do at this point is we can say, 
you know, in, in, in this case, it, it doesn't make sense. But if for, for some reason your minimum bid was approaching the value of the property, we could say, okay, well, let's pull back a little and let's put this more in line with, with the wholesale at 33%. And that way you're starting the bid less and you're, you're incentivizing um, people at auction to um, place bids based on that. Uh, again, uh, one thing I want to point out on this foreclosure, which I didn't mention before, is that if this maximum bid, for whatever reason, is less than your, um, actually, if if it's if it, let's say your maximum bid was three hundred and fifty thousand, okay, and it sold for um, four hundred, which in this case it wouldn't. What happens to that fifty thousand dollars? Typically, that fifty thousand dollars goes back to the borrower. Um, there, there are other things that, you know, if there's liens against the the house or or whatever, um, that fifty thousand will go back to paying the liens. But typically, if there's nothing else to be paid back, that fifty thousand goes to the um, borrower. So you're not always entitled to the full equity uh, at foreclosure. Just keep that in mind. But you, when, when you when you analyze it and you start with a minimum bid and and you go into it saying, hey, I'm I'm gonna this is what I'm willing to take at foreclosure if I set my bid um, properly. And right now we're saying we're setting it at a 50% return. Our minimum bid's 250. The the value's at roughly 343. Um, there's a huge upswing for some for somebody to come in and buy this property at foreclosure. The likelihood of it selling is high. Let's say it doesn't sell, we it come, we get the property back. Now we're wholesaling it, and we're saying that the value at the wholesale is three hundred thousand. At that three hundred thousand mark, we're saying we're going to make an annual return on that of about thirty three percent, which is still really good. So you're you're covered all the way down to this point. Now, when we get down to this point, we'll, we want to determine what's our, our best strategy. Do we just wholesale it out of, the, out of the gate like this? Or do we maybe turn it into a rental? Or maybe there's a fix and flip opportunity here. So we take a look at the rental analysis. And we say, OK, well, based on renting it, the market rent right now is at 2400 And our net cash flow at this point, getting to this point is $792. Our overall capital invested is $189,678. Uh, so you can see our offer price started at 148. Our overall capital invested at this point is 189,000. We, to, to get to this point to rent it, it took 18.8 months. And then we're looking at holding it for 36 months and then selling it. That's, that's what this analysis is doing right now. Hey, I, I want to just point out something as an investor myself. Uh, you always want to look at your, your, all your exit strategies. And any, any, any type of real estate that I invest in, I want to see all these exit strategies. So even though this, this, this note, this example is hairy, a lot of hair, um, based on your bidding on, on this and, and uh, being successful, you have all the exit strategies. So this is really, really a strong uh, opportunity for sure. Um, and uh, it, it, it shows right here. So anyways, Joe. And so one of the things to, to keep in mind when you're looking at the rental, you want to uh, be aware of the cap rate, the gross rental multiplier, and your recoup period. Uh, we've added a few things in here that talk a little bit about that. For instance, you know, the higher the cap rate, the investment is more risky. This is, has a very low cap rate, uh, which which would indicate this is a lot less risky. Now, it's less risky from the standpoint that you know once you take that property back, you're in a good position to rent this. Now, with this rental, you're looking at uh, an annual return of 13.7 percent, an overall return of of 80 percent, and this is over that. Uh, over the full time frame, which is 40, 54 months, with a profit of 151,000. 
So this gives you an idea and you don't have to sell it at 36 months. You can set that to whatever you want and you can analyze it and keep it for five years. You can keep it for a year um, and then sell it as, as a rental to someone else if you want. But uh, this really breaks it down nicely. And if you want to further analyze, analyze it and get into like BRRR where you finance it, you want to know what your net cash flow is, you can go into the finance um, tool up here rather than you know calculating it by hand. You can bring a lender on board. You can set it at you know whatever you want to pull out of it. So let's just say it was a hundred thousand. And and you got that money at a rate of let's say eight percent. And um let's just say that it's interest only and actually let's not put interest only let's put a point on it and um so what what we'll see is we'll see our net cash flow goes down accordingly so now we've put we've taken out a hundred thousand at eight percent and our cash flow went down to 59 it's still positive but now we have a hundred thousand dollars in our pocket and it's cash flowing but based on this, this analysis, it's gonna take 269 years to recoup that at this rate. So it's maybe not realistic to take that much out, but you can take, you, you can find that happy medium and you can look at that BRR and, and figure it out from this analysis. That's just my whole point here. Hey Joe, real quick, uh, another question. Mm -hmm. uh, Linda, Linda asked, um, but for the purpose of velocity of money, would it be better not to rent the property, not to rent it? Yes. Yeah, so if we're looking at all of these different exit strategies, that's what we're comparing right now. So we just looked at wholesale. The wholesale was going to, uh, if we take off the finance tool over here, the wholesale was going to yield us 31.1%, right, for, for our annual return. We're looking at a rental right now that's going to yield us 13.7% but it's gonna do that year on year for um, you know, 54 months, essentially. So a little over four years. And it, the overall return is gonna be 80%. So you know, it depends on the type of investor you are and what you're trying to get out of it. If you're looking for cash flow, that's one thing. If you want to, to sell it, get in and get out, that's another thing. 13.7% uh, um, return on a rental is actually considered pretty good. So, um, you know, that might be the way to go. On, on the flip side, there's also an analysis where we look at a fix and flip. Now, in this case, this is a fairly new property. So I highly doubt, you know, there's a whole lot of fix and flip going to happen here. But let's just say we had to put 42000 Right now, we have it set to a low fix and flip, we could set it to a medium and recalculate our budget up here. And now it's at 73,000. And we can look at the high end of the market, okay? So if we come back to our comps here and we're saying, okay, well, our low end looks to be roughly around 260, 230 on the, on the low, low end. Our high end looks to be around 400. So if we go and we say, okay, we're gonna shoot for that high comp. Now, the square, I, I always look at the square footage. In this case, the square footage on this comp's at 18, 1860. Our square footage is at 2100. This is a four three and we're at a three three. So, that, so we could actually add another bedroom with this square footage if we wanted to, and we can come up to this high comp or get close to it. So, and this is what, um, we did when we first started Revival Brothers, we were buying notes and we were foreclosing on them uh, where people were walking away and we were rehabbing them. And we would do exactly this. And we would set our price at, in this case, at 400 uh, or that 399. And we would come down a little bit. So let's just say we set it at uh, 380 mark, or 385. But knowing that we're going to try to exceed the high comp, which is that 400 mark, and then we we look at our, our rental costs, and in this case we're we're putting in 73,780, and based on on our all in, which would be 254,000, 
we're looking at an annual return of 22%. So if we, if we start to look at all of these exit strategies, you know, it makes a lot of sense to sell it out of the gate and make that 30, 31% if we were to take this property back. But we also have other exit strategies too that we can exercise here. We could do seller financing on it. We can, uh, and once we do that seller financing, we can, we can sell partials. We can do all kinds of things, creative things with it. But at the bare bones of it, we're looking at wholesaling it, you know, whether or not we have the value. If we have the value, we can do whatever we want from there. And renting is one of them. Um, and fixing fl- fix and flipping is another. If this was at that 400,000 mark, what would that look like? At the 400, we're looking at a 26% return on a $73,000 renovation. Now, 73,000 is, is, is a lot. You know, you could probably put another bedroom in there and get everything done on the inside for, I would say, 50, 40 to 50,000 very easily. Um, and if so, if we put it at 50, um, you know, we're, we're, we're now very close to that wholesale number and, um, and we have a budget for our renovation. So at this point, we've analyzed the note. We have a strike price set at 75% of UPB. We have a, a return that's very healthy across the boards. We know what the play is here on the asset because the likelihood of it get re- reinstated is, is very low. It's not going to happen. It's going to go into foreclosure. We know that there's hair on it. There's legal fees that have to go into it. And if we need to bump our legal fees up, we can. And, <clears throat> and our play here is to take the property back. And if we don't take the property back, sell it at foreclosure. So that's that's how that that that's how you you analyze a strike price. Now, let's say that that you're not doing it. You haven't done any due diligence to this point. You don't know if there's back taxes on this. You don't, and there's it's quite likely there could be back taxes on this. But I would I would probably say there there's not because it's been since 2008 and nobody's um, nobody's bought this at at a tax auction. So. Um, somebody's paying the taxes and most likely it's the lien holder who's been paying them. And, um, but you don't know until you, you dive into that, uh, that due diligence. And yeah. in, in order to do that, you just go to the county, the county's assessor's office, you look it up, see if there's any, anything owed on it. We have taxes already calculated in here at 4369. Uh, now this is based on 2020. You, typically, it's not going to raise too much if it, if it does at all. Um, it's maybe going to be a couple hundred dollars. Uh, and this 2020 is based on what was available online when we pulled the data. So um, you can verify that. And you can start to fine tune your numbers accordingly. We also have insur- insurance calculated in here. We have other things like winterization, cash for keys. We have some assumptions in here already calculated uh, on top of our our offer price that's that's feeding our returns which makes this even more uh robust in in understanding our or getting closer to the true return that you might see uh once you get to any one of these exit strategies did you have a question david uh no i did not just no not right now okay uh, so that is, is it in a nutshell. That's how you very quickly look at an asset, analyze it, look at different exit strategies, understand the hair on it and what the potential play is going to be once you acquire this note. What, what are you going to have to do? Uh, obviously there's hair on it. There's legal that has to happen. You're probably going to want to get, um, uh, an exceptions report when you're in your due diligence phase, uh, meaning you've placed your indicative bid at that 147 mark, and now uh, you have that grace period of a week or two, however many days the uh, seller is giving you to do your your, um, due diligence. You find that exception report, you make sure that title's clear. If there's issues on title, you you get them uh, rectified. You know that you're gonna spend money on doing that and you, you apply it accordingly. So let's just say that that 10,000 for foreclosure is more like uh, 15,000. 
which um, it could be. You don't know. There's a lot of hair on this. And I, I know people that are on this call that have spent up to 20000 um, I'm sure Cindy's going to raise her hand anytime soon. <laughs> right. So uh, at 20000 you know, we're, we're looking at our, our returns. And, um, you know, they have gone down, but they're still healthy. It's still safe. So from this point, I would say, okay, well, let's start to look at our worst case scenario. What is the worst case scenario? Let's say the seller isn't going to take less than 80% or somebody else has a bid in that's higher than yours, okay? So you want to put in 80%. You're going to recalculate your offer based on that 80%. Now you're at 80%, 150000 in. You're looking at um, a minimum bid of uh, 272, which is, you know, if we if we recalculated our ARV, which is still a lot less than the uh, value, right? So the likelihood of it selling is still pretty high. If you took the property back, you're still looking at a 26% return. Anything above 20% return is is a home run in my my book. So so Absolutely. you could. You could theoretically, you know, go in and offer that 80% of UPB, uh, and 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 if the if the uh, seller comes back and, and tells you, hey, well, it's not 80% of the balance I gave you, you can say, well, it's 80% of the the UPB, and you can have that conversation with them, and you can you can go back and you can say, well, listen, there's there's um, eight thousand four hundred and fifty three dollars that's unaccounted for. Can you tell me what that's from? Is it is it um, did you do some kind of loan modification at some point? Or are these fees that um, are that went towards the borrower for non-payment? What is that? And you'll get an answer and you'll find out whether or not it's interest bearing. If it's interest bearing, then you can tack that onto the, the balance and you can bid against that. Anything that's interest bearing. But if it's not, and the likelihood of you recouping that, I would leave it out all, all together, you know, so. That's how you, you start to really dive into these notes and, and, and get the numbers set straight. Of course, there's due diligence that still has to happen. You're still going to want to, you know, check to see if there's any liens, mechanical liens, any kind of liens against the property. It could be a lien sitting at the county uh, because the grass wasn't cut. You know, it could be, it could be anything. I mean, there, there could be your property could be in an area where it's affluent and there's an affluent tax or something. I mean, I've seen that before, but you want to do your due diligence. You want to make sure that you're covering everything, but I will say this, that it's not all that important to do all of your due diligence before you submit your indicative bid, because you have the ability once the seller has approved your indicative bid to further your due diligence. And if there are issues, related to um, to the note, meaning there, there's, there's uh, exceptions that need to be accounted for on title or whatever it is. Maybe there's um, allonges that are missing, you know, maybe there's uh, some unforeseen liens that you didn't see when you were initially doing your due diligence. You can bring that up and bring it up to the uh, to the seller at that point and fade your bid accordingly. And if and if the seller doesn't um, accept that, then you can you can pull out of the deal altogether. I will say this though: don't enter into a bid unless you're unless you have the capability to follow through. Because if you if you enter in and you're wishy washy and you don't know what you're doing, and you know you you come to the the final days you know, before you're supposed to fund and the seller's asking, you know, are you okay with everything? And you haven't done your due diligence on it and you pull out, you're going to get blacklisted and you're not going to be able to purchase anymore through, through that um, entity. So, yeah, um, hey Joe, another question came up, a uh, question about uh, uh, boot camps and classes. Uh, do you or do you and uh, Sabrina, have any education boot camps for classes for node investors? We do, yes. And uh, if anybody's interested in getting together with Sabrina and I, um, you know, just give me a call, email me, and we can get you set up. We're, we're actually working on quite a few things at the moment. We're working on um, not just the note side of it, but we're also looking at rehabs and um, 
and alternative investments, mostly in, in, in the rehab side of it. We're doing uh, Illinois at the moment, Ohio. We have a whole system set up in place uh, that, that we're going to be pushing fairly heavily because we, we actually have a steady um, – we know where to get the assets. Let me just put it that way. And the assets are coming in consistently and um, we know that we can hit specific benchmarks on those so that's happening we're looking at um, creating uh, an area where people can actually log into some of these webinars and and look at the videos uh, we're, we're trying to get those videos online the problem that's been in the past is we've we just haven't had time to do it and we're at the point now where we think we can make it happen yeah. so um, yeah to answer your question, we, we've got lots of lots of things going on. Give us a call, uh, set up a, an appointment with us, and we can kind of go over what what we have and, and, and kind of listen to you and what you're looking for and maybe find a happy solution for you. Yeah, with, with our experience, and besides notes, we have all, other types of experience as well. So if you have any questions, uh, we're more than happy to answer, uh, answer those. Um, we do love the IPA because it gives you all the extra strategies and uh, I, we use it daily as well. So, And, and David has a phenomenal amount of experience in, in, in flips and rentals and um, holding property and all that kind of stuff, especially in, in Florida. So um, if you guys have any questions related to that, feel free to reach out. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Um, so are there any questions up to this point? I know that was kind of a lot to take in, but um, you know, especially for people that are, are fairly new, I didn't want to really focus on, on IPA too much, um, but I wanted to illustrate how easy it is to go through a note, one with hair on it, and arrive at a strike price that actually works for you, where most people would shy away from it because of the hair. So hopefully I was able to communicate that with you today. If there are questions after this, feel free to reach out to us and, um, and we're happy to, to help out. Absolutely. David? Yeah, uh, there's no questions yet. I mean, any questions, feel free to, to, to ask. We're here for you. Um, it could be notes, it could be real estate, it could be anything in reference to, to that. So uh, let us know. And, uh, you know, Joe, this is a good example, I think, of not just the typical note. Uh, this is something beyond, you know, uh, the, the typical note. There's firsts, of course, that don't have uh, late payments. There's seconds, depending on what position they're at. Um, and then this, this is Harry. So this is a little bit beyond uh, non-performing. But based on the exit strategies and what, what we're showing here, uh, you still can be comfortable and confident to to, to buy something this kind, this kind of asset. And you so, know, it, it's funny you mentioned that, David, because um, you know there's there's been all kinds of studies done, and uh, what what ends up happening is a lot of people will spend money, lots of money, doing education. I'm not saying education is bad; it's actually pretty good. But they'll spend all this money doing education. But the sad part is, is 90% of those people will never buy an asset because they don't have the confidence to do it. And, right. um, and, you know, I, I think that confidence is, is probably the, the one thing missing in a lot of education out there. And if a tool can give you that confidence, then why not? You know, I mean, it, it could launch you into uh, uh, a whole new career. Who knows? There's a question here. How often is the soft, software updated? Um, it's updated almost on a weekly basis. Uh, Last update, I think, was a couple weeks ago. Uh, we, we, yeah. we have an update coming out today, actually. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, if you if you have a copy of it, um, make sure that you click on that update button. And if you have the old version, the 1.0 version, make sure you schedule an appointment with us to get you set up on 2.0 because it's a completely different build and uh, everything is 100% different on it. So. Yeah, I highly recommend uh, to do the upgrade. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's de definitely helpful and uh, a lot of other features in there as well. So it's it's definitely everybody should, should uh, be on that. And any questions about it, of course, reach out. 
and uh, we'll be reaching out to you as well. Uh, we have 10 minutes now left uh, for the for the webinar. So any other questions, feel free to, to answer, um, ask any questions, and uh, you know we can uh, we'll, we'll answer those questions for you. You know the, the access strategies that you mentioned. I mean, right away you talk about confidence, and and yes. Right here, a tool that that's that's used just for that reason. Um, I mean, it, it it gives you those extra strategies immediately, and right away, it just uh, you know intens intensifies the uh, your success in helping you in this process. You won't find this this type of uh, software out there. It's uh, very unique and and specific to this nature and. Man, I loved it as soon as uh, we got together and um, I use it all the time with my investments. So, um, it, <laughs> it, looks like, that show, so anyway. it looks like we have a question here. Um, uh, somebody's asking, can can they get your contact information? You might want to, uh, that's in the Q&A area. You might want to give them that. Okay. David. Yep. yep. And, um, and somebody says, I'm new to this information. May you brief me? Give me a brief explanation on the term Harry performing versus non-performing. Okay. Yeah. So I knew that was going to come up, Joe. I knew that. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Harry basically means that um, there, there's multiple things that, that are wrong with the, the, there's usually a reason why a property has been sitting there um, for a period of time without any kind of action on it, especially from through, through servicing. So what, what does that, what does that mean? That means that, you know, uh, if in 2008, they stopped making payments, if we could, if we take a look at our, our AM schedule again, it looks like they, they made payments up until 2008. So we already know that, that the 2008, uh, recession, hurt this, this, this borrower. I mean, that's pretty obvious. That's what happened here. Now, who was the lien holder at the time comes into question. And, you know, why didn't the lien holder uh, go into foreclosure with this? Well, you know, at the, you got to keep in, in mind that at the time when all this was happening, there was uh, all kinds of um, furloughs happening. There was... Um, um, extensions on uh, foreclosures. Foreclosures were, were were actually shut down altogether. There was all kinds of things that 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 would make it very difficult for a lien holder to move forward on a foreclosure. So that probably happened. It probably went into a huge stack of notes, and out of those notes, um, maybe it was on the bottom and never got um, touched until now. And somebody wants to, to unload it and unload it quickly. And they know that there's a lot of hair on it. The statute of limitations is hit. They know that there's going to be some expenses on uh, legal uh, to get through that statute of limitations, to also get through foreclosure, to also, um, you know, get the servicing back in line, to contact the original borrowers, to make sure that there's communication there. Uh, there's hair on it. Yeah. There's things that have to happen in order to get this uh, this asset either performing again or through the foreclosure process. Now, most in most cases, you're saying, how do I re-perform that note? That's the question that, that most people ask. And in this case, it's probably not going to happen. It's They just owe too much money. It's just they're not going to re-perform. So, so the question is as well, they're... They're, they're basically living for free right now if they're still in the, in the property and they're not paying a mortgage or a rent. The question is, is how do you get them out? And the only way is through foreclosure. And then once you go through foreclosure, you have to go through an eviction process. Um, you know, if they, if they don't leave, the, um, the sheriff is going to have to show up at the house and they're going to have to evict them accordingly. So people that know how to work the system uh, know how to do it very good, and you have to find legal representation that can that knows that and knows how to work around that as well. That's what we mean by Harry. Not only that, there could be title issues. We don't know yet because we haven't seen the collateral on this particular asset, but there could be 
title issues where, you know, you can't even foreclose until the title's cured on it, right? And what does that mean? That means that you either have to figure it out yourself or hire a company uh, to do an exceptions report and let you know what it's going to take to cure that, um, to cure the title so that you can move forward with foreclosure. That's right. what we mean by hair. All, there's there's a multiple multiple things that could happen. That we just don't know, but we want to account for it. And we want to make sure there's enough money there that, that we're not going to lose on the deal when we when we purchase it. Yeah, based on your bid, you know, you have that safety net right there for for the these issues that, that could come up. And as as uh, Joe was saying, uh, there's there's something about the note that 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 needs to be, you know, cured or or something about it. So that means there's more of a discount. So based on the extra strategy that, you, that you're going to see, it's confident and comfortable to know. Okay, well that makes sense. I'm, I'm okay to do it. That kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. but you still need to do due diligence and something does really come up that doesn't make any sense, then you can cancel out. Um, one other, another question came up by uh, Joe from Stacy. Okay. Uh, they ask, um, is the tool for sale, meaning IPA, how much? And do you have instruction guide and how to use the tool? Yes, it is. You go to our website, revivalbrothers.com. There's a, there's a tab there uh, called IPA. In fact, I think I have it open here. Let me see. Uh, we have five minutes left uh, so any other questions let me know just going to our website right now to show you guys where to go uh, and it'll kind of explain everything for you you just go to property analyzer revivalbrothers.com go to about ipa and it talks about it um, what it does and how it works there's a video on it you can purchase it. Uh, all the purchase information is here. If you want the automation version, it's roughly $1,000 uh, plus a $25 a month for the data plan if you want everything automated when you bring in that data. Or you can, you can just have the manual version and in, input the data yourself, which uh, it, it operates exactly the same. It's just the data doesn't come in you know, automatically for you. That's all, it's only a difference. So yes, to answer your question, it is available and you can go to our site to purchase it. And yes, there is information related to how to use the tool. In fact, in every sheet, there's a little video at the top that tells you how to use the sheet. And, and there's additional videos and tutorials throughout the whole thing. There's also a glossary at the end where uh, you can look at the videos online, you know, for, for different aspects of it. And we're always adding videos to it as well. So um, there's, there's also this glossary section, which explains the calculations, it explains different terminology. What is a cap rate? What is cash on cash? You know, what is a GRM? How is it calculated? Why, why, you know, why do I care about it? It explains all of that in addition to, in the, in the application itself, you can mouse over any of these areas that have this red triangle on it, and it explains a lot more about that function and what it does and why it does what it does. Hey, uh, Joe, I have another question. Uh, Fred is, an, is asking, uh, can you talk a little bit more about statute of limitations? Sure. So in this new version, what we thought would be important to add is the statute of limitations. Each state has a different statute of limitations. And, you know, when you exceed the statute of limitations, it's not that the note isn't any good or the lien holder doesn't own the note. You just have to go through a legal process to uh, reinstate that the, um, I guess, the ownership of the lien itself. So, um, and to basically wipe out the statute of limitations to start over. So there is a legal process that has to happen. And this is why we put this in there so that you're aware of that. In the state of Georgia, for example, there's a six year state of statute of limitations. We're at the 14 year mark, so we're, we're way past that. So there's definitely gonna be some legal action that has to take place before, um, before the lien can be reinstated to the lien holder as um, you know, basically a clear lien. 
to move forward with uh, anything like foreclosure, you know, or or taking the property back. Now, if there's there's issue on title, that's a whole other story. Um, something in addition that you have to to clear. And again, that goes back to the story of hair on the on the asset and what you would need to do in order to uh, clear everything so that you can move forward with with foreclosure. Yeah, just uh, just to emphasize what uh, Joe's saying, uh, being confident, <clears throat> you know, you contact the professionals at hand, the attorney. I had experience with that as well, where uh, that was a question that came into hand. So the attorney mentioned to me on this one asset that I was uh, bidding on, he just said, as we were foreclosing, <clears throat> they just would do a quiet quiet title action, and that would that should suffice that in that state. And uh, so that was that was the answer I got from the attorney. So um, yeah, each state is different. You got to ask those questions, and um, yeah, you'll figure it out. And one thing we also have added in here is information related to the statute of limitations. So we have links that go directly out to um, areas online that talk specifically about statute of limitations related to specific states. And all of this correlates to uh, our software and what, what you're seeing here. So uh, also with the foreclosure as well. So any of these links will go to foreclosure sites that talk about foreclosures in the specific state that, that you're interested in. And uh, redemption periods are also important. You know, what are the redemption periods in specific uh, states? Well, one of the things we have in this software is we have a redemption period that is tacked onto your overall time frame. So if the redemption period was two months, six months, that time frame would get tacked onto your overall time line for the analysis on your um, annual returns, which is super important. And this is, these are things that are overlooked a lot of times when you're doing simple calculations on your returns. But this, this software actually takes into account a lot of, of expenditures and information that you wouldn't otherwise maybe overlook. We've even uh, gone to, to, to the steps in the AM schedule to take a look at what those expenditures could be. So if you were, you were doing due diligence, for example, um, you know, what is, what is it at, what's the average cost for title reports, O&E reports, uh, um, any kind of lien reports, you know, what is, what is servicing cost you when you're dealing with a hairy asset? You know, it's going to cost more than your $45 a month on a performing note. I guarantee you that. Uh, how much does it cost for a credit report? What about a BPO? Uh, photography, recording fees. There's there's a fees that a lot of people don't talk about that are tacked onto on top of your your bid that have to be accounted for. And um, we we have things in here that that you can add if you're doing an analysis on strictly a, a performing note. You can come in here and you can you can add those numbers in here and you can really start to fine tune your overall um, return. So I know that we're at time right now. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, yeah, I, don't see... Joe, I, I had another question that came in. Do you want to answer it or do you want to answer it offline? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, I, a question came in and it asked, is there a list of properties your company provides us um, you can have to go search for properties yourself? Uh, yeah, we actually have, the Revalo Brothers has also uh, established a trade desk. Uh, if you go to our website, revolverbrothers.com, you go to trade desk, uh, you can sign up to get access to our trade desk. You'd have to log in to get it. Anyway, I'm happy that everybody was able to join us today. Thank you for coming. And we will see you next month on the first Tuesday at the same time, noon. And uh, if you have any questions in between then, or you want to how maybe you have a one-on-one -on -one with us to talk a little bit more about IPA, or you're thinking about purchasing it, give us a shout and we're happy to help you out.